Well, good morning to you. I'm Dr. Mike Stowler, the Dean of Baptist Bible Seminary in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, pretty long ways from here. I've been there 18 years, not as Dean, um, uh, but I went there in 1994 because of the balance between academics and ministry that I found at the school. And I was looking forward to spending some time with, the, uh, with those of you who are looking at seminary. I'd love to talk to you uh, during this day and spend time with you. I thought I would share a little bit about uh, my journey just briefly here at the beginning before we get into the actual message so you have something to identify with in my life. I was not raised in a Christian home. In fact, I was only in church one time before I was 20 years old. In fact, when I was a, in, a senior in high school, I went to a, a meeting, they called a meeting of all the club presidents, homeroom representatives, and all the faculty one afternoon. It was a large school, 2,500 students, my high school. And they had uh, about 200 people in this meeting. And they were debating no pass, no play. If you don't pass your courses, you can't be in the band, you can't play football, you can't play basketball. There was a big debate about that. This is a long time ago. And as I was sitting there listening to everything, I decided, like most people, I want to say my two cents worth. And I stood up and I faced those 200 people. It was the first time that I ever done such a thing. Of course, what do they say the greatest fear people have? Public speaking. And I looked out at 200 people and I had a panic attack. I did not get through one single sentence. It came out gobbledygook. I sat down red in the face, embarrassed. Everybody there was embarrassed for me. And I said to myself and to God, I will never do anything with my life that makes me stand up in front of people. I was not saved at that time. I was not a Christian. Four years later, as a senior at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, a local church reached out to me. And I came to Jesus, and I was changed. And I still, I mean, standing up here, you are a scary bunch. It's just that way. Public speaking still has that to it, no matter how long you speak. But you know, if God can change me, somebody who couldn't even get one sentence out and then use me in the ministry for over 30 years, now that's something cool that God has pulled off. And I'm not any more special than any of you sitting out there. He can do that with you too. So as we go through the day and we spend our em uh, emphasis and our thinking about the Holy Spirit, just remember that. We, we do have a great God. We just sang about him in a great way. And that great God is someone who cares deeply about the success of your life and your ministry before God. Well, the topic for this first session is the Holy Spirit uh, and the New Covenant. The Holy Spirit and the New Covenant. Uh, that's a, the New Covenant. Uh, I come from the dispensational tradition. And in the dispensational tradition, that's probably the doctrine that we disagree with each other the most on. Uh, and we argue about concerning uh, the Holy Spirit and other things relative to that New Covenant. So I thought I'd walk through that today and this morning for you. Uh, and I'm going to begin with the New Covenant and Israel. We want to start there. Uh, the focus of today's conference is on the Holy Spirit's ministry today, and I will get there. We're going to talk about today and what the Holy Spirit does not then in, in our time. But we want to look back to the Old Testament. And I want to talk about the New Covenant and Israel, and I want to start in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. There is a context to develop that we don't have time to develop, but, uh, and I encourage you, one of the best things you can do with Bible books, even these big ones like Jeremiah, is to sit down in one sitting and read the whole book. Read it in one shot together, and you, it's amazing what you'll see when you do that. In verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we see right away this thing that's called a new covenant. The idea of covenant is an arrangement between two parties. Some people prefer the, a different word, agreement. Uh, it's not always an agreement. Sometimes it's a promise from one party to another. 
Other times it's an agreement. It's used in a lot of different ways in the Bible, in, in the simple relationships of families and others. Other times it's used uh, relative to God and certain peoples. And here he says there's a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So this new covenant is going to be made. I'm having trouble punching this thing here. Can you guys advance it for me, please? Over there? Is it Paul? There we go. The new covenant is going to be made with Israel and with Judah. Now, who is that? It's Israel and Judah. It's the two kingdoms of the Jews, the Israelites. God makes this covenant, or the promise is he's going to make this covenant with them. It's not like the Mosaic covenant. Look what it says. Verse 32, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, back then, the Mosaic covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So it is not like the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant emphasized externalism, external things, still had a, uh, the heart issues were still there, still part of that in God's law, but it still emphasized those things, and it could never, through its observations, bring about the transformation necessary for someone to be completely close to the Lord. And God promised Israel there's going to come a day when I'm going to make a new covenant with you, not like that Mosaic covenant. It's also not a renewed covenant as I look at the passage. It's a covenant that is brand new. It's not the old covenant made better. It's not the old covenant energized. It is a brand new covenant. In fact, the promise here is that it's going to be made or cut in the Hebrew thinking to cut a covenant, to make a covenant, it's going to be made with them at some time in the future. So let's look at that, the elements of the new covenant. I've just said it will be made in the future. Let's look at verse 31 again. Notice, I will make a new covenant. That new covenant is not being made in Jeremiah's time. Jeremiah is a prophet who's prophesying in the 500s B.C., a little bit in the 600s B.C. too, but he's in the early days of the Babylonian captivity. That new covenant is not being made in his day. It's going to be made in the future. And look at verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make, still future. So it's not something that's in his particular time. But I want you to go over to chapter 32 and look at uh, verses 37 through 41. <clears throat> Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation, and I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. Now, some might think, well, that's at the end of the Babylonian captivity. Let's read on. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Now, the idea that God has given Israel a covenant that has actually uh, made them always fear him has never happened to this day. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant. I think he's talking about the same things in context. It's a forever covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. That's never happened to the Israelites. And so when you look at this passage, you see that it's sometime made in the future. Now I've got a diagram here to kind of help you visualize this. In Jeremiah 31, you see the promise and the prediction of the new covenant. Jeremiah, again, put 600 B.C. down for that. Then later, Jesus comes and dies on the cross. But Jeremiah looks down to the end of time and the second coming, uh, the, the time that the covenant is made with Israel. He said, how do you know that? The Jeremiah 31 passage did not say that, and our Jeremiah 32 passage Hints of that, 
Uh, let me give you a couple passages to look at, Ezekiel 20 and Ezekiel 22, if you look at those two chapters. You'll see in the time of tribulation, at the end of that time, the cleansing of the nation, there is the cutting of a covenant. And I think it's the same covenant. Ezekiel 36 also refers to that in the context of the end time days. So Jeremiah is making a prediction that points to the end of time, the time the covenant is made with Israel. However, we have to deal with other passages in the Bible as well. The cross, the death of Jesus, according to Hebrews 7 through 10, is the time that the basis for the new covenant is established. It's not when the new covenant is made with Israel, but it's the time the basis for the new covenant and the blood of the new covenant that provides the forgiveness of the new covenant is established. And Jesus did that in his death on the cross. So it will be made in the future with Israel based upon the Jeremiah 31 passage. But there is also a law on their heart. Go back to Jeremiah 31 and look at verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, within them, and on their heart I will write it. On their heart I will write it. Paul talks about that, and we'll pick that up in 2 Corinthians 3 here in just a little bit. talks about the difference between the law written on stones, the Ten Commandments, the law written in the heart of people, which is different. And so here there is a law on their heart that is part of that. And then the Bible says here that God will be their God in verse 33. Now that's a bit odd. Wasn't he their God back then? And the answer is yes. He's talking about a level of relationship that goes way past and the sweet fellowship that goes way past what Israel had in that time. And so God will be their God and they will be God's people. This is a special prediction, special promise of what God is going to do. And full knowledge of the Lord will be available. In verse 34, they shall not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. There is great knowledge of the Lord that passes what you and I know today. You and I see darkly through a glass. There will be full knowledge that God will give to them in that day. And then, of course, forgiveness. I think nationally and individually, the full national restoration of the nation, which has not happened yet. I don't look at the Israel that started in 1948 as the final restoration of the nation. That is something that is yet to come, and God will carry out his promise to Israel in that time. Now, this is something that's important for us to understand. You say, okay, that's interesting if I take it at face value for the nation of Israel, and I believe that, so what? Does it matter? It's important that we understand the promises that God makes to Israel. I have, I have personally been accused of being an extremist in my interpretation of the Bible. And uh, one particular writer uh, of note uh, called me an extremist because I take the word Israel. Now listen to my extremism here. Are y'all listening? Here's my extremism. I take the word Israel to mean Israel. It's important that we understand the promises to Israel. And those who believe that God has turned his back on Israel and Israel is no longer part of the equation or the, there's been a transformation of the promises as God laid them out in the Old Testament. If God can change those or remove those, how can we be sure he won't change or remove the promises he's given to us? What about the end of Romans 8? That beautiful passage on eternal security. Romans 8, the chapter on the Holy Spirit's ministry and sanctification for us. And at the end, the eternal security that he gives through the plan of God, through the Son of God, and through the love of God. How can I be sure? How can I be sure that God means it if he's changed promises somewhere else in the Bible. So it is important that we understand the new covenant. But that's something that God will do for Israel. It's a promise made in the past and the future. But we need to talk about the present. 
And so there's a lot of discussion among the dispensational camp that I'm part of concerning the new covenant and the church. In fact, in Luke's gospel and the Lord's Supper passage and all the Lord's Supper passages uh, talk about the new covenant. Uh, Jesus refers to the blood, uh, the cup of the new covenant of his blood. And so the question of the relationship the church has to the new covenant that was promised to Israel in Jeremiah 31 comes to play. So how do we look at that? There have been four major views among dispensationalists that I, in my camp. In fact, I just edited a book on dispensational understandings of the new covenant. And there are three views in that book. That's because one of these views uh, never didn't show up for our conference that we had on the new covenant a few years ago. <coughs> Uh, the first view is that there's one new covenant to Israel and none to the church. And so the church really has no relationship to the new covenant. And the spiritual blessings the church has, that sounds like the things that are in the new covenant that we just saw for Israel, those things are just analogous. They're just similar to those things. They're not really those things. It's kind of like the question, is a 55 mile an hour speed limit sign in America the same as in South Africa? see the same speed limit sign, of course, there it's in kilometers. Is it the same, same law? Is it the same thing? Or is it two separate things that are just similar? And that's the way these folks kind of look at that. One new covenant to Israel, none to the church. And they would emphasize passages like Romans 9, the covenants belong to Israel. They don't belong to the church. The second view is that there are two separate new covenants, one for Israel and one for the church. And so God has two new covenant plans that was popularized by Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. This is the view that's not represented in my book because nobody showed up at the conference to represent that view. Very few dispensationalists today hold that view. And as far as I can tell, Lewis Berry Chafer probably invented that view. The third view, <coughs> which is my view, and it's the right view because it's got the most colorful diagram up there. Now that is one new covenant to Israel with indirect application to the church through union with Christ. The new covenant, yes, is given to Israel. The Romans 9 passage is true. The covenants are belong to Israel. But the blessings of that new covenant are given to the church through our union, the way we're plugged into Christ. We're not party in a legal sense to that new covenant, but we still receive the blessings of that new covenant uh, that, that pertain spiritually for us. And then fourth, uh, one new covenant to Israel with direct application to the church. Uh, you have uh, the same one new covenant, but it uh, is applied by God to, to both the church and to Israel directly. Now, in these views, I hasten to say that how the Christian life is described and what happens in the work of the Spirit in our Christian life in all these views is the same. The first view sees analogy. The second view sees analogy. You have two formal new covenants. There's analogy. They're similar. And the third, the third view and the fourth view, all, all those, they're really closer together than I at first thought when I started to edit that book. And so what we see in the new covenant uh, is a pointer to the Spirit's work uh, in us today. And I want to look at that in the last section of our, um, of our notes. And so if you take your Bibles, turn over to 2 Corinthians 3. And we'll talk about New Covenant ministry through the church. New Covenant ministry through the church, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. First thing I want to say here is that Christians are a letter of Christ written by the Spirit of the living God. Let's look at that in the first three verses. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter. I mean, Paul is being deeply personal here. I don't need a letter of recommendation from you about my ministry to you and through you. You yourself are that letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. 
You know, and it's this passage and others like it that, will, that we hear all the time from preachers, that you are the only letter that, about Jesus that people read, lost people. Then he goes on to say, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink. And I think he's hearkening back, based on what's later in the passage, to the letter of the law in the Old Testament. But with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You can see hints of this in Deuteronomy 5. You can see hints of this in the Psalms. You can see that, but it's something that has come to fruition in the Christian church in a special way. And so you have the Spirit of God working in the hearts of Christians. He's going to relate that in a minute to the New Covenant. Look in verse 4. We come to the... Uh, the statement and such confidence. You want to underline that word or circle that word confidence in your Bible. It, has a, it carries on throughout the whole passage. We live in a day and age, and you guys need to understand this as Christians at a Christian school. You need to understand how special you are. There are a lot of secular universities all across the, camp, all across the campuses of the United States and around the world who are having men speak up like me at conferences and telling people how Jesus is a jerk. And the apostles are wrong and that Christianity is an idiotic faith. That's being taught all over the place. Now, who is it that keeps Christianity alive, humanly speaking? I know God's at work, but he's at work through what? Through us. And you have a very special place in that. And in the West, it seems Christianity is in decline. That's Europe and the United States. That's true. We are in decline. And sometimes when you're in decline, you tend to hide. But we've got to be careful with that. We need to have some confidence. I want to come back to that point. He says, and such confidence we have through Christ toward God... Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And then notice, according to Paul here in verse 6, Christians are made adequate to be servants of a new covenant. But our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And I don't think he's, he's there's, you can talk about eternal life. The law doesn't give you eternal life. The spirit gives eternal life. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, God comes in and regenerates you. There's that, but there's also the ongoing living of the Christian life, the living out of the Christian life, that is the spirit giving ongoing life. I think it's all in there as the passage goes on to say. <clears throat> but if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones talking about the Old Testament law, came with glory. It was a special thing. So that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face. And I take that literally. That's not just a story. That really happened. Fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Servants are made adequate to be servants of a new covenant. We have a ministry to win people to Christ. We have a ministry to proclaim Christ to the nations. We have a ministry to reach the world for Christ. And it's through the power of the Spirit and his helping us to be witnesses, helping us to live the Christian life out in the sphere of our influence. It is God who is working through his Spirit. And Paul here relates that to the new covenant. The new covenant given to the church. We are in union with him. And the blessings of that new covenant. Blessings of forgiveness. Spill out of us. And onto others. I think it's possible to theologically relate this. To the passage that talks about. Uh, the love of God is. Uh, just comes out of our hearts. It's just put there by the Holy Spirit. 
and the, the living water that the, comes out of us through the Spirit, God working in us that we might make a difference in the world. And then you keep on going. Uh, it mentions that glory, verse 8. Now, what does that mean, glory? Because my next point is Christians enjoy greater glory than the law of Moses can give. The word glory certainly carries the idea of light sometimes in Scripture. Sometimes it carries the idea of boasting. I think in terms of when you're thinking about the end time days, it's talking about the God's glory, the hope of glory, which we'll talk about in the second uh, chapel session later, uh, that God has this great future hope, so it's the idea of greatness in the Lord that's there for the word glory. And so you and I can have an experience I think is the point that is greater than the experience of the law of Moses. So we have a glory. Now, let's see what that leads to in the passage. Verse 9, for if the, uh, let's, uh, for if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory on account of the glory that surpasses it. What's he saying there? Is that the glory that's in the Christian life leaves the glory of the law of Moses in the dust? For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Having therefore such a hope, and notice this, we have great boldness in our speech. Boldness and courage. That's going to come up again in the second session as well. The ministry of the Spirit in the new covenant to us leads us to have great boldness. I don't know about you, but I am timid by nature. If a wasp were to fly into this room, I would leave. Somebody else would finish my uh, message. I have some timidity with certain things. And you know, I have knocked on somebody's door. I've gone by to visit them, to talk to them about the Lord, and I was so thankful they were not home. That's happened. There is that fear factor in sharing our faith. It's amazing. You have to spend so much effort to get Christians today to say something for the Lord. And in the first century, they were trying to shut them up. There's something about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When you see it in the book of Acts, you see this boldness that's produced by the presence of the Spirit. And you and I tend to turn that off. And I'm not saying that we need to be obnoxious in sharing our faith. I don't mean that. But there needs to be a certain amount of boldness. And even in our weakness, sometimes God will work and override our sinful nature. Let me give an illustration. Back in the old days of the bus ministries, back in the 1970s, I was saved in 74. Uh, I was a bus captain of a section of our town, the poor section of town, and I would visit every couple, a couple times a year, I would canvas every house in my section of town. I'd knock on every door and talk to them about Jesus, ask if their kids could ride the bus to church with me. Now, you can't do that today. It's hard to do that today. I knocked on this one door. I was toward, the, it was a canvassing day. I knocked on every single door. I was tired and sweaty, hot summer day in Alabama, where I'm from. And I, and I heard that they were in this apartment. I knocked and I heard them in there. TV was on. I heard people moving around. And I kept knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. Why didn't I just leave? They didn't come. I got mad. I just kept knocking. Finally, the door opened, and there was the biggest woman I ever did see. She could have punted me into the next county. And you know what my first words were to her? This is quite amazing to me. still is. I said to her, it's about time. You ever say something, and you know as soon as you said it, you're reaching out to grab the words and bring them back in? Well, that was one of those times. By the grace of God, her kids were on my bus the next morning. Why in the world would she do such a thing? 
lunacy. No, it was the grace of God through the power of the Spirit. God overrode my sinful disposition at that moment. Through the power of his Spirit, he did a work. And at least I had the boldness to keep knocking in some way. We need to have a boldness and a courage. And in fact, the New Covenant ministry, all the things that God's given us and the work of the Spirit in our hearts here pushes us toward a boldness in our faith. And in our day, we need that. We need a little pushback in a godly way, not an ungodly way, but they're pushing on us hard. We need to push back and hold our ground and say the truth is the truth. It's all about Jesus and his spirit will help us do that. And then the final thing, verse 18, if you keep coming down, uh, in verse 15, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart, talking about the Jews. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The life-giving Spirit, the Lord, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. God is transforming us. See, the first point of boldness is outside of ourselves. The greater glory is what God does in us to produce a witness to the world. And the, the greater glory, secondly, is the transformation in us that makes us different and makes us grow and become more and more like Jesus every day. And these are not just words in a theology book. These are words from the Apostle Paul, words 2,000 years ago that still ring true today down the corridor of time that makes all the difference in the world. So we look at the Holy Spirit of the New Covenant and realize that it should produce in us something special and so if, if you're struggling in the area of boldness and you're struggling, struggling in the area of transformation, yes, you can always go back and check, well, have I trusted the Lord? But I don't want to preach to doubt because Christians who are truly born-again Christians can struggle with these things. And Paul lets us know we have a special power that can change things forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your written word. I pray you might continue to use it throughout the rest of this day to speak to our hearts. Lord, thank you for your new covenant ministry and the ministry you've made us adequate to be servants of in the world. And its blessings allow us to be strong in our faith of witness and allow us to change, be more and more like you. Thank you for that greater glory, for it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.